And so we begin our series. Our fall series is on, uh, of course, based on the, the movie The Wizard of Us and is uh, based, we're using the book by Gene Houston called The Wizard of Us. So The Wizard of Oz, The Wizard of Us, you see the little play there. <laughs> and we're launching that today along with our fall study groups, as Linda mentioned earlier, and there's still some slots. So if you'd like to be in a fall study group to go a little deeper into the material, um, then we certainly invite you to do so, and you can sign up after service. So as we enter now, as you noticed in the clip, it went from that sepia, it kind of, you know, Kansas Dust Bowl, Depression era, tornado, all that stuff that was going on, the foreshadowing, right, of Dorothy's life into Technicolor, into Oz, right, the other realm. And so, as you might imagine, I've been thinking a bit about the Wizard of Oz this week, and um, yesterday decided to go somewhere for a little different inspiration. So we were um, sitting at Brioni's, the regional park, and after a while I said, you know, I, I just have to go um, with Toto, which was Dakota, um, the dog we're fostering, Charles's dog, and, um, and, and, and go walk the labyrinth. We, we need to go in our own little you know, space. And, and so off we went. And there had been like a whole high school there. So when we arrived, we were looking for peace, you know, and there was like all these kids everywhere. And I mean, it was, it was fun and exciting, but we had to find a little nook somewhere. So as, as spirit would have it, you know, when you get the call, the urge at the right moment, right? Because I'd been sitting for quite some time before I decided to do this. And I scooped up Dakota, AKA Toto, and I, Kristen, AKA Dorothy, went off to the labyrinth. And um, we went through the woodland, of course, to get there. And on the way, it was very interesting because the kids had set up some, I don't know what they were doing, but they had these stations. And so I walked by, it was just like, you know, you're walking through the woods and all of a sudden there's this colorful um, display with a kind of a tic-tac-toe thing and a couple of people just sitting there by station number one, which also felt sort of magical Oz-like, you know? <laughs> and then we go through the meadow and, and there's 10 teenagers coming our way, you know? And, and by the time I get to the labyrinth, there's a man there taking up station number two. So now we have it to ourselves. And so uh, Dakota and I, Toto and I, go into the labyrinth and, you know, we get to the center. And if you know about labyrinths, the, f the pathway in is like a shedding. So you're kind of letting go of whatever's on your mind. So you set, start with an intention, a prayer, and then you walk in the, the path. It's a prayer walk. And the, the prayer walk in is a letting go. And then when you get to the middle, it's the centering. You know, it's the place where we commune with spirit, like we just did in a meditation. It's that real deliberate kind of space. And when I turned and looked up, literally, it was like I was in another realm, like I saw everything in a different way. And as I was looking across, the fields literally were like golden fields because the, the way the light was. And then the sky was turquoise in, with, with puffy white clouds kind of drifting through. And I kid you not, nobody was in the field except for a man on horseback. <laughs> I mean, it was just like... This, this, like I entered Oz, you know, like something just occurred and I've just entered Oz. There's this other realm. And I guess the point of me telling you that is that any moment of any day, you know, we just kind of pull across the veil and we enter into that otherworldly realm because it's all here for us. It's what we mean when we say heaven on earth, that we're bringing heaven to earth. It's here, it's just a matter of us opening our consciousness to it, inviting it in, saying yes to spirit when spirit says, go that way, you know, and following those nudges. And it opens us then to that realm that maybe we didn't see a moment ago. Maybe when we were in our sepia or our black and white life, where things were mundane and unhappy in many ways, we didn't notice or know that there could be such a shift in realms. In fact, we thought it was somewhere over the rainbow, if you will. You know, in the story, if, if, to remind you of the story a little bit, Dorothy is, um, she's dissatisfied, basically, with her life. And that's what often spurs us on to the next thing. It spurs on our journey. Sometimes it's a desire, and sometimes it's a dissatisfaction or a discomfort, and, and often it's a co combination of the two. And so in Dorothy's case, she's a young woman. She's in Depression-era Kansas. It's, you know, a dust bowl. She's an orphan, 
and her Auntie M and Uncle Henry, while they're doing the best they can, I mean, they're trying to survive, right? So they're more concerned about the survival of the baby chicks than they are Dorothy's need for love and attention and, and fun and all the things that kids need, right? So the best thing that Dorothy has going is Toto. <laughs> and then t she's got a problem there too because Miss Gulch, one of the neighbors, doesn't like Toto and his Toto digs in her garden, right? So, so then Miss Gulch makes a big to-do of it and takes Toto away. Her one love, right? Her one pleasure, her one joy, her one uh, you know, place where she gets that love and attention. And so you know, what's a girl to do? <laughs> but dream of some other life somewhere over the rainbow. There must be some other life, right? And of course, Toto's so connected to Dorothy that he runs home. He finds a way to escape. And interestingly enough, Miss Gulch ends up being the wicked witch a little bit later. So we've got this storyline going. You know, and so, so Toto comes back and, and Dorothy decides she's going to pursue that life, that other life, that somewhere over the rainbow life. So it's, it's the calling that she's speaking to, right? We all have that calling in us, that, that soul calling, that spiritual guidance for what's, what are we becoming? What is the, what's the technicolor life we're being drawn into, that other realm, that heaven on earth? What is it that, that we're being invited into? And of course, we can refuse the call. In fact, uh, Joseph Campbell talks about the stages of, of a myth. You know, there is, there is the, the first one is the call, and the second one, closely behind it often, is the refusal of the call. And the final one is being the master of two worlds. And so that's really what we're after, is that mastery of the two worlds. So the, 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 um, just to give you a little backstory on, on this story, The Wizard of Oz, the, the original was a book, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, and it was written by a man named Frank Baum. And Frank Baum says that this story came to him in 1898 whole. I mean, it just was like a downloaded whole story. He said it started with an inspirational thought of a young girl in Kansas who swept up in a tornado. And then he said the whole story just wrote through him. And then he, find, he, he put the kind of the completed crosses of the T's and dots of the I's this is interesting too, on December 31st, 1899. You don't get much closer to the turn of the century than that. You know? So isn't that interesting that you know, 120 years later almost, we are still revering this story and understanding this myth. So Jean Houston, our author, talks about myth. What is myth? And she says it's not just an old tale. It's not just a story. It's like a living breathing. It's a, a code. It's a map. It's a, it's a road. And so if you think about that as myth lives in us and each of our souls have kind of a coding, you know? There's, a, there's like a blueprint, if you will, of our souls. Now it's maybe not mapped out exactly all the, you know, this is gonna happen and this is gonna happen, or, but there might be a, a general idea, this is my belief anyway, we come in with a general kind of idea of what our lessons are in this lifetime and what, what are sort of the, the major things we are meant to get to come to the next level of our evolution. And so that might be the kind of the coding she's talking about. So the myth speaks to that. It reflects back on that. What better myth than this one that has so much recognition? And then the map is sort of what we hold, what we bring with us, you know, in our hip pocket, the sort of we take it out again and say, oh yeah, now where am I headed again? You know, what, is my, what are some of my ideas, my vision, my goals? my desires, what's on my map? What's on your map? <laughs> what is it that you're holding on your map that is sort of guiding your life in a way? I mean, hopefully your map is guided by spirit and some of it then you won't know. But maybe, maybe you do have a really clear idea of I have these goals and these goals and these goals. And so hopefully if that's the case, you, you recognize that some of that is human made and you give lots of space for spirit to work within that and some openness to change, you know, the signposts around. And that's where we come to the roads. The roads are the choices we make, right? At any given time, we can choose to go left or right. We can correct our path. We can cut through. We can make a U-turn if needed. Uh, we can go very long on one road. We can go through, 
you know, you get it. This is all sim symbolic of what our journey is about. And so, so it is, myth is also a way then to reflect back to us the soul coding, the map I carry, and the roads I choose along the way. So today we're embarking on this journey, if you will, onto the Yellow Brick Road, along with Dorothy. Dorothy is the heroine of our story. And so, you know, the, the, in Joseph Campbell's stages of the hero's journey, often the hero uh, is, is one who slays dragons, right? There's a lot of physicality, there's great adventure, there's, that's, there's, that's kind of the story that we know well, right, from all the action movies and, and so on. It's not often that we get a heroine's journey. And so it's, it's Dorothy's heroine's journey from so long ago that is such a guide for our times, that, that, that feminine essence that is in all of us, that is not slaying dragons, not necessarily wielding weapons, but using our emotionality and our spirituality and our wisdom to move through the blocks that come along the way in our life, the challenges that arise. So it's a different, a little bit different strain, but it's still that same idea of the journey and the stages of the journey. And, the, and so um, the journey is basically a journey of self-realization. That's what we're really signing up for here, if, if you're wondering what you're signing on to in these next seven weeks. It's really about saying yes to realizing the self, the big S self, the essence of who you are, your own soul, your own divinity, understanding things at a deeper level of who you are and what is that encoding that you're beginning to, to reveal for yourself and at, at a whole new level. Now, we've, many of us in this room have been on the journey for quite a while, so we've, we know the road a bit, we know where we've been, and, and now we're kind of always on the next, the next leg, right? There's always a, another wind to our path. There's another way we can choose to go. There's another fork in the road. As long as we are living and breathing, that will be so. And so why not just enjoy the journey and say yes? <laughs> you know, because when we say yes, it's all the richness of spirit that is available to us, the, the textures and the multi-colors that are available to us. It's the full spectrum. When we refuse the call, well, who knows what gets lost? Sometimes we find out and sometimes we don't. And so if we just always choose the safe route, then we will miss out on whatever that next stage is. So in this journey to revealing the self, it's quite an adventure just to understand the self. Deepak Chopra wrote the foreword of this book and in it, he gives this quote about the self. He talks about what, how the self is amorphous. He says, and there's a slide for this, the self is the ultimate mystery because no matter where you grab hold, it shifts and it expands, it evolves and it evaporates. It leaks off into shadows down below and light up above. And so it does indeed take at least one lifetime, if not many lifetimes, right? To sort of decode this soul, this individual path, this journey, the magnificence of the self. And at the same time, whenever we are saying yes to our own journey and saying yes to the call and to the opening up of who we are and the realization of the self, there is a, a whole reverberation in the collective psyche that says yes as well. And when we shut down and we say no and we refuse the call, there is something lost. And nobody else can do it but you. Because every soul is unique. Every soul has something to bring that is just theirs to give to the world. And we are made up of this wild, diverse, beautiful spectrum of life and each one encoded in a little bit different way and a little bit so if you say well if I don't do it someone else will they won't do it like you would they can't it's not possible that somebody else can feel fill the void that your individual soul can can bring so I guess in a way I'm urging you to say yes today to say yes to the journey of self-realization, which includes then a great benefit to everyone. 
You know, a part of the refusal or a reason why we refuse is because of fear, right? And sometimes the, the discomfort that, that starts to bubble up for us, that starts to encourage us to go to the next level, is, is a little bit, a little bit shadowy. You know, definitely in Dorothy's story, it's very shadowy. Like the whole thing, the black and white, the bleakness, the depression, the being an orphan, the, the next door neighbor who becomes the wicked witch. And, and then Dorothy's shadow itself comes out. You know, here's this innocent little girl and then she says, I'll bite you myself, you wicked witch. You know? <laughs> so she's, you know, there's sort of that, the resentment and Dorothy coming forward too. So you can kind of see that there is this, this shadow and it's not, we know this in our world too, right? I mean, we are living in, a, in the times of light and shadow. As somebody told me this morning, you know, the, the bigger the light, the deeper the shadow. <laughs> and so, you know, I know right now we've got a lot of that happening, you know, just, just it, there's a lot of um, division in our country. And, and you know, we're, for those of you who've been tuned into the Supreme Court process, there's this, you know, these very emotional, beautiful, you know, in a way, painful testimonies of two individuals who are representing two different positions in the country, but we can all feel it, right, on both sides. We can feel the emotion of both. And so we are, we are in that place of shadow and light, but what a beautiful place to be in a way. You know, it's hard, yeah. And so, wasn't easy for Dorothy. That's why she's dreaming of somewhere over the rainbow, as we all may be too, right? But it, it, the, the beauty, I guess what I'm trying to say is the beauty of the journey is that it doesn't separate. It's not like we're on just a personal spiritual journey in our own little box. It's not possible that what we do is reflected in the world and what happens in the world is reflected in us. And so we can't not talk about one without the other, recognizing that there is a, an energetic field in which we are playing right now that is ripe and rich for transformation. The subtitle of this book is The Transformational Lessons of Oz. And so when we say yes, when we don't refuse the call, but we say yes to the call, we give the gift of greater light to the world. And these shadows, yeah, they're here, but thank God they're here. Instead of being pushed down, they're being revealed. So we can see, wow, we've got work to do, right? Male and female, Democrat and Republican, black and white and brown, we've all got work to do together to understand each other, to work together, to weave the understanding of spirit and soul into what will resolve our issues in the world. So I say, thank you, God, that the shadows are being revealed, even though it's hard to look at, you know? And so this is where we are in this ripe time, and here's this old myth from 120 years ago, and it's, wow, still relevant. And fun, it brings a little fun and lightness into what I just brought up that I can feel is now heavy in the room. And so, and so know too that where there is that heavy shadow, there is great light that is coming through. There is great light, and you are the bringer of that light. And you are the bringer of that light by simply saying yes to that little urge inside of you where spirit says, go left, go right, step in, it's time. That dream you had 20 years ago, it's time. The dream that's bubbling up right inside of you and you don't wanna get still and you don't wanna go into meditation because you just know you're gonna come in contact with it again and then what? It's there, it's like bubbling at the surface, it wants to break through, right? It's like the chick and the egg, it's already pecking its way through, you can't ignore it anymore. <laughs> it's come, it's time. You know Dorothy was scared to be, you know, to run away and then to feel the call of Auntie M tugging back to go home. We all say no a lot of times to the call because we're, we don't wanna upset the apple cart of our lives, right? It's pretty comfortable, even if it's a little painful, it's like sort of comfortable pain, right? And so a little discomfort, oh well, that's just the way it is, which we talked about last week, right? And, and, but, but it's not, um, but there's more, there's always more. And if we say yes, if we don't refuse, and if we understand why we refuse, it helps us. So part of the, the refusal sometimes is not only just fear, but it's also this mis misinformed idea of selfishness. You know, in Chinese, there's two definitions for selfish. 
One is the one we typically refer to, this idea of like blatant harm to somebody, to do something for your own good that is going to blatantly hurt somebody else. But the other definition is to simply do something to better yourself. And a lot of times in the English language, we get those things confused. And we say, well, if I do something to better myself, you know, Auntie M's going to be upset. <laughs> Auntie M's going to miss me. Auntie M's going to be sad, or Uncle Henry, or whoever in your life. And spirit called you to do it, <laughs> right? So it's like, wh which way are you going to go? The refusal of the call is going to be more painful, ultimately, for everybody in the world and maybe slightly more comfortable temporarily for the people around you. It's a bit like The Journey by Mary Oliver. You may be aware of this poem, but I'd like to share it with you again because it, it feels um, appropriate. She says, one day you finally knew what you had to do and began, through the vo though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice. Through the whole house began to tremble and you felt the old tug at your ankles, mend my life. Each voice cried, but you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do, though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations through their melancholy was terrible. It was already late enough and the wild night and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the, sh though the, sh through the sheets of clouds, and there was a new voice which you slowly recognized as your own. And it kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing that you could do, determined to save the only life that you could save. So sometimes, even though everyone's pulling at our ankles to stay, <laughs> We need to go in whatever direction that is that we're being guided to go. Years ago, I went on a, a vision quest, my first one in 2010, and I was on sabbatical at the time, so I'd been away from home for a long time. And uh, Brenly met me at the airport, and we kind of finished our journey together, or my journey together, and spent some time together. But I'd been through a lot. <laughs> And I had owned new pieces of my soul that I hadn't owned before on that vision quest. There was a, a spirit wolf that came to me and that part of what the wolf represented, the fierceness was something I was taking on as a part of me that I hadn't had before, that I hadn't expressed before. So I was still in process, right, of incorporation when she shows up at the airport in, a, in our relatively new relationship. And she didn't like the new me. <laughs> quite honestly, that fierceness was still not quite I incorporated into who I was, so it probably had some rough edges. And she said, oh, I want the old sweet Kristen back. You know? <laughs> and so this is what people in our lives may be afraid of, and it may be what we're afraid of too. If I change, what, what are my relationships going to look like? And the people in our lives are saying, oh yeah, don't change. It's comfortable how it is. But that's not what we signed up for, is it? I guess that's the bad news. We didn't sign up for the comfortable journey. Did you know that? Is this new news? <laughs> not comfortable, but oh, so fulfilling. And when it is oh, so fulfilling, of course, we have times of comfort and we have times of challenge. We have times when we're in brand new territory, when we're stepping out onto the yellow brick road in our ruby slippers for the first time. We have times when a witch, wicked witch is gonna pop up and all kinds of things are gonna pop up on our journey. And we might even have times where we feel like we're spinning around in a tornado in a house. And yet, and yet, we say yes. And why do we say yes? Because we know without a shadow of a doubt that every time we say yes, that life turns technicolor. 
that it gets more rich, more exciting, more fulfilling, more engaging, and we feel more enthusiastic and more alive in our lives. So we can always choose the road of comfort and that road of comfort may come with a great cost. So just be clear of what you're choosing when you choose. And if spirit inside is knocking at your heart from the inside to get out, <laughs> then I want to really urge you to say yes to that call because it is that call that truly will be paved in gold. So what else, what else, where else do we want to go? Really, we just want to be mindful of the journey, mindful of what's available to us, mindful of saying yes to the call, and mindful of when. And then to recognize that that realm is just a breath away, that other place, that otherworldly, heavenly place that we bring here by simply, you know, just an easy moving of the veil and a stepping in a letting go of the shields around the heart so we can be the heroine and the hero of our own journey. And so, like Dorothy, we can be ready to follow the... Are you ready? Are you ready to get on the Yellow Brick Road? Yeah. We're in Oz. We might as well, right? <laughs> Let's see how, how Dorothy does. You know, when we line up, when we do this, our whole being begins to line up. Like, like the munchkins are like the thoughts and the feelings and the cells of your body. I say yes to the journey of self-realization. Let's say that together. I say yes to the journey of self-realization. And so it is.